Welcome, welcome everyone. Good evening. Or uh, who said good morning as he was walking in? Was it Jackson? Uh, I, I won't say good morning, I'll say good evening and welcome to the Northside Summit. Um, before we get into tonight's program, uh, I'd like to acknowledge our generous host for this evening. Uh, welcome also to National Sawdust. Um, you know, I've lived in this neighborhood in, in Greenpoint and, and worked in Williamsburg, uh, living here for more than 20 years, and one of the things that I absolutely love and adore about this neighborhood is its approach to uh, previously industrial spaces. So I don't know if any of you know this venue. Um, I, you may not know uh, from looking at the walls around you uh, that this used to be a sawdust factory here in Williamsburg. Uh, and you may not be aware that you're actually sitting in a state-of-the-art spatial sound system. So before we get started on our topic for this evening, which is, is a bid the answer, uh, I'd like to invite Brian Shu from National Sawdust to uh, give us a little bit of more insight into uh, the beautiful design of the room. Thank you so much. Hi. My name is Brian Shu. I'm the venue operations manager here at National Sawdust. We're so happy to have you guys here today, and uh, we're, it's, a, it's a pleasure to host everybody. A um, few things I want to just go over with you about the room that you're in. So, as mentioned a moment ago, we are in a converted sawdust factory. Um, so, we've, this, we're about to be entering our 10th season uh, in the fall. And what we did with the place was we kind of built a room within a room. So what we're in right now is you see this sort of like, imagine this is like almost like a canvas tent around you. And on the outside of the canvas tent is another brick wall that is on the far exterior of the wall. So if we were to pull away these white panels that you see around you, you would be able to see through the wall into the brick wall behind it. Um, the Black channels that you see are made of steel, and they are a, the structural foundation of the room that we're in. So all of our lighting infrastructure, all of our sound infrastructure, our electrical infrastructure is all, um, is all tethered to that black channeling. Um, and so the room itself is kind of suspended on that. In addition to this, there are a number of acoustical springs that are underneath you on the floor. They're suspended from the, from the ceiling and holding the, everything on this canvas tent around you um, kind of in place. The purpose of this is to create an acoustically sealed environment. You may notice that the door that you came through, if you look to your right, it's no longer there. It's now a wall. Um, so we have a, it's a, an acoustically treated blast door, garage style blast door that comes down and it seals off the room uh, from the outside surroundings. If you were to just go back a few yards behind you, Wythe Avenue is right behind you, but you would never know it because you can't hear it, you can't hear the cars going by, you can't hear anything like that. And what's especially great is that because of these springs and the acoustical treatment of the room, things like the L train down on Bedford Avenue, we don't feel that. A lot of rooms, you would feel that, and this can be really important if, you, if I stop talking for a moment. It's very quiet in here, right? <laughs> Very, very quiet. So what's really great is that we can have really, really quiet, intimate performances, a solo violin player, a singer-songwriter on guitar. You don't even need to amplify them, and it can be a really great, immersive experience for everybody. Um, what was mentioned was the, the immersive sound system. Uh, this is a, by the, a, what's called the Constellation System by Meyer Sound. They're sound partners with us from California. And if you look to your, if you look over here, you see under this light here, you may see a, a little speaker right under that light on the wall. Everyone see that? A little black speaker. <clears throat> there are over a hundred of these spread throughout the room, behind the walls, and in the ceiling. The panels that I mentioned before that are covering those holes, they are made of acoustically transparent material called Tando Spandex. If I were to hold up a, a curtain in front of my face, like a, like a, like a, like a window curtain or something like that, my, 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 my voice would be muffled to you. If I were to hold up that material to you, it would have no difference at all. It's acoustically transparent. Because of this, we can have those speakers behind the wall. So the entire time that I've been talking, the system has been on. What the system allows us to do is, if you see the array of microphones hanging from the ceiling, it picks up everything that happens in the room and can redistribute it as natural sounding reverb. The entire system has actually been on the entire time I've been talking, and if I turn it off, this is what the room actually sounds like. Pretty crazy. 
that dropping of the phone sounded a lot less impressive than it would have if the system had been on. Um, so, so right now we're in what's a small concert hall, so it's about a, a, just about a second and a half of decay time. If I were to turn on Cathedral, this is 2.3 seconds of decay time. Woo! And what's really interesting is that it, the microphones are smart. So they know where I'm standing in the room. They can triangulate my position. They know that Brian's over here right now, so, the, so my voice should travel as sound does here first and then go over to that far corner of the wall last because your brain is really good at picking up these weird sort of irregularities in how it's hearing things. So it could be able to understand the uncanny valley of like, this isn't quite right, but because it knows exactly where I am and can can make my voice sound as if it's actually really ricocheting off of that wall last, your brain isn't tricked by it. It's pretty impressive. And it also allows us, as you've been noticing, I haven't been talking with the microphone for the past few minutes because it, it isn't necessary. The room is treated enough where it doesn't have to happen that way. This also allows us to mix, I'm gonna turn the system off again. This also allows us to mix in 32 channels of audio and can let us play something like this, which would, this is a little demo that was made by the, by the uh, person who, one of the uh, pioneers of the system. So you listen, you, we can mix, we can have a guitar over here, a bass over there, drums over there, vocal, vocals over there if you want, with this sort of immersive, sort of 360 degree perspective, it allows you to do some pretty cool things. So I'll let you listen for a moment. Clapping music by the composer Steve Reich, uh, so I can pan things. Pretty cool. So yeah, so that's what we're kind of capable of doing at National Sawdust. Um, we, have, we have immersive performances like this, well, not like this, a little better than this. Um, we have immersive performances happening all the time. Definitely come back and check our calendar, come back and see a show sometime. Um, we have things happening pretty much three to four, day, three to four times a week. So uh, yeah, we'd love, we'd love to host you again. Thanks. Does that mean I don't need the microphone or? Uh, it's up to you, right? <laughs> So, uh, so that was a that was a hip opening. Um, so we're going to go back to bids now. Um, but it is really no surprise that there's this revolutionary music venue here in the heart of Williamsburg, because really the artistic and cultural scene of the community really has been driving economic growth here for many years, if not a generation. Um, the implications of that growth is what we're here to talk about today and what we're here to explore. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'd like to focus on specifically is the impact of that growth on the public realm in this neighborhood. Um, rather than talk about what I mean by the public realm, some people may know what I mean, some people may not know what I mean. Uh, rather than use words, I'd like to show you.
So uh, I'm certain many of you are familiar with some of the scenes that you've seen in there, which is why you're here today, to potentially ask the same question that we're asking. So is a bid the answer? And in thinking about that question, we partnered with a leader in parks and open space, uh, in policy and in, and, and in issues, both uh, in this neighborhood and also on a citywide level. Um, our council member, Lincoln Ressler, is one of the only council members with a climate action plan. He's on the council's parks committee. Uh, he has spearheaded the District 33 Street Tree Fund, and he's someone who fights for more parks, come on up, better parks, cleaner streets, safer streets, and who understands the critical dynamic between and among these distinct and disparate spaces. So Lincoln, would you like to say a few words? Sure. That was such a oh, that's no that was such a nice introduction, and that was such a cool presentation from Brian. Isn't this space amazing? Like National Sawdust is amazing. How many folks have been here before? All right, about half and half. So armed, it's like I'm so happy to see more people in here. I've come to many performances here, although I'll tell you my favorite have been when students that go to a, go to programming at El Puente have come to perform, which they do each year here. And it's just magical to hear them sing and play instruments in this amazing space. So thank you to National Sawdust for hosting us. Thank you to Katie and the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance. And what a dope video that was. I was totally inspired by it. Um, you know, we've seen so many changes in the North Side in recent years. It's almost hard to recognize uh, certain blocks. And it's clear that city services haven't kept up. Uh, our streets are dirty. Uh, we're not as resilient a community as we need to be. And there is no organization that provides ongoing advocacy support programming for the business community in the area. This is one of the densest commercial districts in Brooklyn. Um, certainly, you know, rents on North 6th Street are going for more money than I could possibly fathom. Um, and yet, we don't have a dedicated group that is advocating for the business community that is better maintaining our public, our public realm. And that is why a business improvement district is so darn important. Uh, they can absolutely, you know, and I, am, I can tell you as a council member, I've got six bids in my district. They're about 80 citywide. We've got six of them in kind of the downtown Brooklyn area. And they do a tremendous job of helping to keep our streets clean, uh, but it's, and which is a big deal here in the north side where frankly our streets are not clean enough. My office pays for ACE, pro ACE workers to go out and clean North 6th Street five days a week, to clean Bedford Avenue five days a week, and still the conditions are not what they should be. They're not what we should all expect. Um, with a bid, whether it's through the Doe Fund or another nonprofit organization, they have dedicated workers out there every single day cleaning up the streets, making sure that we have uh, a cleaner, safer neighborhood. Uh, but we can also, but a bid can also help make our neighborhood more resilient, whether it's doing tree care events or cleaning out sewers and catch basins before a storm or maintaining new green infrastructure projects. A bid can be a partner that can help make that happen. And you might be thinking to yourself, Business Improvement District, there for advocate, to, uh, there to advocate for businesses, which it absolutely will be, and the bids in our district host amazing events that bring neighbors out, bring folks to Atlantic Avenue and to Dumbo, um, to Montague Street, to support our local businesses. But we are partnering, you know, North Brooklyn Parks Alliance is leading this effort as, you know, the steward of park spaces for us across Williamsburg and Greenpoint, because we don't want this to just be a business improvement district to support the business community. We also want to better maintain the public realm. And so whether that's the substandard conditions on the Esplanade or helping to maintain our open streets or creating new public plazas, investing in improved conditions in our street trees and our parks, that's what the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance excels at. And so we're trying to think about a new compelling vision that can improve the quality of life for everybody on the north side by making our streets safer, by making our neighborhood more resilient, and by improving our public spaces. And it's not an easy or simple process to organize a bid. Uh, we knew uh, when we were getting into this that this is gonna be a multi-year effort, but it's so darn important. And the con current conditions in our neighborhood are not what we should all expect. And this is a tangible way that we can make it better. And so I really am excited about this effort. It's one of my top priorities here in Williamsburg. Uh, we've been partnering with Councilmember Gutierrez's office, and Alex is here. Um, 
she and I share the north side together, and so we're working on this in partnership, and we've been you know, forming a terrific steering committee to help create this bid. And I just wanna thank everybody who's been involved, thank all the new faces who are out here tonight learning about this, because I'm confident together that we're gonna be able to make this happen. So thank you so much, and look forward to the conversation. I'm Katie Denny Horowitz, I don't think I mentioned that before, of the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance, uh, Executive Director. Um, several of my uh, team are also here, and in particular I wanted to thank uh, Lynn and Diego up, up, in the, up in the back, and Teresa for helping to put this event together. Um, Esteban is also here, who is our Assistant Director of Operations. We'll get to that later. Um, and the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance, for those of you who don't know, have been in this neighborhood serving Greenpoint and Williamsburg and really all of Community Board 1 for the last 20 years. Um, it's a very broad scope. That district-wide mandate is what makes us unique from other parks conservancies that typically uh, handle and maintain uh, and have a management agreement with a single park or a single space. Um, but in the negotiations for the 20, uh, 2005 rezoning, it was important that the benefits uh, of that rezoning wouldn't just serve the people who were living on the waterfront, waterfront, but that those benefits actually served the people throughout the entirety of Community Board 1. Uh, it was a model uh, that was set up at the time, uh, again, to not just serve affluent areas, but really to be a neighborhood-wide organization and serve the entire neighborhood. Um, this is our impact map here, so that gives you a sense of the breadth of scope of where we're hitting. Um, it's, that's the, the services that we provided uh, in 2003, uh, sorry, 2023. Um, and that's the reason we're able to have this conversation about the public realm, right? Because we work with the Parks Department on parkland. We work with the City's Department of Transportation when it comes to open streets and public plazas. We work with the State Department of Transportation on managing under the Cay Bridge Park, which is a seven acre open space underneath the Kosciuszko Bridge that we uh, opened in 2021, and I highly recommend you go if you haven't already. Um, and in working across this, these spaces, seemingly disparate, we provide services primarily across two teams, horticulture and operations. Our horticulture team is comprised of gardeners uh, that are in dedicated spaces, mostly our largest parks, like under the Cambridge Park, like McGulrick Park, uh, soon to be uh, Bushwick Inlet Park. Um, but our hortic team isn't just maintaining the gardens that are there. Uh, we're also rethinking the kinds of gardens that should be here based on our environmental past that I hope you all are aware of. One of the services that we provide is cultivating a native nursery at Under the K, where we grow tens of thousands of wild native plants to be able to distribute across the neighborhood in schools and community gardens and other parks to friends groups. Uh, to better serve the neighborhood, and again, going back to serving the distinct environmental history that we have here in Greenpoint. The operations team is primarily mobile. So when we talk about serving an entire community, it's actually roving services to be able to hit not just the parks and not just the open streets, but the spaces that you probably don't think much about whether it's the dog runs within the parks, whether it's those darn storm drains that are the, 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 the worst sort of collection of floods during a heavy rain, or whether it's sweeping the public plazas and the curb space as you're walking down the sidewalk. In doing this, we're starting to tackle what we're really here about today, right? It's the gap between the services that the city provides and the level of services that a neighborhood might need on any given day. So the next question I'd like to ask is how do, how do we, or, or how do we either as a North Brooklyn Parks Alliance, but maybe as a community, how do we fund these services? How can we make up that gap, again, between what the city can provide based on its resources and what the city actually needs based on what's happening on the ground? And so for us, we're a nonprofit organization, uh, Parks Conservancies often have uh, charitable giving, right? We, ha we, go, we go to foundations, when maybe we go to government grants or we have individual membership programs, right? Um, we might apply for corporate sponsorships. 
And if you think about how the city funds these services and you hear about budget cuts, you heard a lot about that during the pandemic, right? And you experience what those budget cuts actually meant on the ground. Some of the footage that was in that video was taken during the pandemic, right? You maybe saw an uptick in trash, maybe encountered a rat or two, maybe you still are. So last fall, when you heard about more budget cuts, was it 5%, maybe you heard about 10%, maybe even about 15, you have to think about how that impacts the workforce that's actually providing these services in a city and how that is gonna impact the sanitation services and the park services and really what we're talking about is your quality of life. So the next question isn't how we fund these services now but how can we sustain this level of services in the future? And we all know that cuts to our essential services uh, we know what those kinds of cuts and the impact that can have on our neighborhood because we've seen it. Uh, the number of, of the population only here in North Brooklyn grew 25,000, right, since the, since, since the rezoning. Um, that's 25,000 more, 25, more people who live in the neighborhood, who walk down the streets, who eat at the restaurants, uh, who maybe work here or are taking the bus or are taking the train. Here in the north side, just looking at north side of Williamsburg alone, businesses have also grown. So since March of 2020, uh, the number of businesses just in this district we're looking at right now that we're gonna talk about tonight has grown 10%. So what do those businesses need, right? So what do those, what kind of services are they not getting uh, that they should be getting given the growth and economic opportunity that they're creating? So one of the models we're looking at is a business improvement district. Is that the answer to the, these challenges we're facing? And we're gonna get deeper into what a bid is when we bring up our panel. Um, but in short, it's a special designated geography that receives special services funded by an assessment on the property owners in that district. The geographic area that we're talking about tonight is, as I mentioned, north side of Williamsburg. Specifically, we're talking about just north of Bushwick Inlet Park, North 15th Street. And when I talk about this as an area, I'm not talking about what the bid boundaries are. I'm talking about what we're exploring right now as a possibility. What we're looking at trying to capture what the needs are in this particular area. Because in order to uh, get uh, a better understanding of your needs, we're serving the people, the property owners, the businesses on the ground to better understand the priorities of the people here. So I'll ask you, what can you do right now? Um, this is a, um, uh, a part of the process where we're doing a needs assessment, right? So that's how we're understanding your priorities. And we that's where we are in the process here. Uh, last fall, we began uh, forming a steering committee. So the, we have members from SBS here. The Small Business Services manages the bid formation process. And last fall, first step, you form a steering committee representative of the property owners and businesses and residents that, are in the, that might be affected by such a district. We're conducting a needs assessment. And that's what I would love your help with now. So I'm gonna ask you to, to take out your phone, scan the QR code if you haven't already taken the, the survey so that we can start gathering more responses and be able to move to the next step, which is better understanding the services and the boundaries uh, that this potential bid can provide. And while you all do that, I want the panelists to come on up. So we have Aaron, Clara, Angel, and Kurt. Come on up. So these, these folks were selected uh, with great intention. I do nothing if not on purpose. Um, and so uh, in thinking about a business improvement district and asking if it's the right model for us, um, and we want to think about, is that the right question to be asking? It, is this the right answer? Uh, we felt that you, we really had to look at how other neighborhoods are doing it, right? And so how were other bids structured across the city? And I was in Flatiron recently, and I saw, I was walking through Madison, you know, Madison Square Park, which is beautiful, beautiful park in the midtown of Manhattan, so clean, so nice. 
they do such a great job there. Um, but I was walking there and I was looking at, I was at the plazas around the park and I thought, well, jeepers, this isn't too, too, too far off from Banker's Anchor, which is a, which is a plaza that we manage um, alongside a number of volunteers in the, in the neighborhood, um, almost as a way to approach expanding the footprint of McCarran Park through the public plaza program. So I was really curious to, to hear how the Flatiron uh, Nomad bid was, was working on that. Um, and then here in, in, in North Brooklyn, you take the ferry south and you go to that fancy place called Dumbo down there. And I thought, well, this is a neighborhood that you go and they, they, they really killed it at the open streets program. They have great active programming, tons of street activations, tons of street furniture, so clean. And I said, how are they doing that there? And then you might go on the ferry and you might go all the way up to Long Island City. I call Long Island City a bit of our sister neighborhood because you know they might be right across the Pulaski. You might be in a Queens. We love Queens. Um, but uh, you know, Similarly, it's a neighborhood with a lot of mixed use, a huge surge in development after the rezoning. A major difference between Greenpoint and Williamsburg and Long Island City is they have a bid that's been around for, I should have known this, what, at least 30 years. Since 2005. No, but the original bid. Um, yeah, so the partnership has been around for f almost 40 years, and the bid has been there since 2005. And they are going through an expansion right now because of the population growth. So I figured that these would be great case studies to start this conversation. And then, of course, I invited Aaron Piscopink, who is of the Grand Street bid, uh, our only local bid uh, here in the neighborhood, to be able to have that conversation of knowing who we are, knowing this neighborhood, uh, what kind of questions to ask. And so Erin is gonna be leading this discussion. I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks, Katie. Hey friends, thank you all for coming. Um, I'll quickly say I'm Erin Piscoping from the Grand Street Bid. I'm a North Side neighbor, I live at North First in Bedford, a board member of the North Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, so lots of little connections to the neighborhood here. Um, sorry to be the person who reads my notes, but all of the panelist bios are so amazing that when I was trying to shorten them in my brain, it didn't feel fair. So, <laughs> first is Clara Schumacher from the Dumbo Improvement District's Cultural and Community Programs. She supports Dumbo's ecosystem with marketing and small business resources and runs Point on Neighborhood Communications. Since joining the team in 2015, she's launched a dozen cultural programs, presented thousands of performing and visual arts on Dumbo's public and projected stages, helped install dozens of public artworks, and told countless stories of Dumbo's businesses, artists, companies, and more on social media. The Dumbo Improvement District was founded in 2006 to enhance the neighborhood and amplify Dumbo's creative and innovative vibe. In the years since, the bid has realized the addition of thousands of square feet of public space, installed dozens of public artworks, hosted hundreds of events, supported hundreds of artists and small businesses, and weathered one superstorm, one global pandemic, and many, 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 many rounds of street construction. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Kurt Kavanaugh, who joined the Flatiron Nomad Partnership in 2016. As, pres as Vice President of Planning, Streetscape, and Capital Projects, he manages the daily operations of the Flatiron Public Plazas and seasonal open streets, including the Nomad Piazza pop-up, various public art installations, and everything related to bike and pedestrian safety. Kurt also oversees the district-wide horticultural program and works closely with the partnership's field operations, marketing, and economic development departments on strategic initiatives, advocacy, and planning. The Flatiron Nomad Partnership, founded in 2006, has helped transform the bustling and diverse neighborhood to a vibrant and shared place for residents, commuters, visitors, and an ever-growing business network. Then finally, we have Angela Hart, who's been with the LIC partnership in 20, since 2019 and has been the director of bid operations since 2022. Angel has a background in student engagement and urban planning, graduating from Oxford Brooks University with community and regional planning master's degree in 2018. The Long Island City bid was established in 2005, originally encompassing the commercial corridors along Queens Plaza and Jackson Avenue to Court Square. It's since expanded to include the commercial corridors continuing along Jackson Avenue, Vernon Boulevard, and 44th Drive. Managed by the Long Island City Partnership, the bid provides supplementary sanitation and visitor services, services within the district and carries out community development and marketing initiatives that benefit the greater neighborhood. Thanks, panel, for being here. <laughs> I'll start with a question for each of you, and maybe we can go in order. Um, curious to hear from each of you what project you have been working on with your bid recently that you're particularly proud of. 
Okay, I'll jump in. Um, I wanted to talk about the Dumbo Projection Project, which is, a, I think, a very good example of how bids are uniquely positioned to bring a lot of resources and people to the same table to get big things done that benefit lots of different stakeholders and community members. So Dumbo has a long artistic legacy. We have a long history of video art projection in the neighborhood, hearkening back to Dumbo Arts Festival days. And in August of, 20, 20, uh, August of 23, we finished a project called Lightyear, which had run for 100 months, almost nine years, where every month we did a different video art show on the side of the Manhattan Bridge. And we thought, this was curated by Dumbo artists. We'd worked, the bid had funded it. We thought this was a good moment to think about how this project could evolve. And this turned into the Dumbo Projection Project, which now is not only on one side of the Manhattan Bridge, but it is on both sides of the Manhattan Bridge and also on the BQE in Dr. Susan Park, which is a new, new-ish city park that has come, you know, Robert Moses-esque asphalt, now beautiful, regular city park. Um, and a few things made this happen. One, SBS uh, announced a lighting grant. Thank you, SBS. I don't know who's here from SBS. And we, um, which we applied for and received, and that's money that only bids could have brought to the table, and that allowed us to buy projectors, upgrade projectors, um, kind of invest in the infrastructure. Two, we have very deep relationships with our property owners, and so we're able to literally rent the window that we need exactly across from the bridge to get the exact angle, and you know, the property owner is thrilled to be part of this project. Um, three, we have deep, deep, deep relationships with the Department of Transportation, and the art, program, bridges, literally every agent, like department within DOT, who not only trust us to do a good job, but also went to bat for us to get bridges to sign off on us projecting on the BQE, which was sort of an unusual to them ask. Um, and then we have so many cultural partners in the neighborhood that we always work with, and we're able to have a really robust open call. We had over 200 proposals. We had a panel of Dumbo artists. We picked 12 artists and have now been running this project every night in all these spaces through the end of April. So, and we'll do it again next year, and we'll do it again the next year. Uh, so just a good, you know, something I'm very proud of, but also something that really shows how we can be this coordinating force that brings lots of different kinds of things to the table to, to do something really interesting that supports the arts ecosystem, solidifies Dumbo as a creative space, and you know, brings a little joy to Dumbonians in the very, very cold, like Williamsburg, uh, windy depths of winter. Wow, how do I follow that? That's <laughs> incredible. <With> a <laughs> Um, in Flat Art Nomad, uh, two things, I think. Um, one is um, surveys show that 97% of people walk, bike, or take transit to the district. So it's very much a uh, foot traffic first neighborhood. Um, so we've worked with DOT to slowly claw our way back from auto dependency on Broadway to people first Broadway. And that um, has been done through uh, work over the years for public plazas and pedestrian extensions and just making it a place to walk and be and spend time and sit. Even if you're not buying something, you can spend time in the district because guess what? Every pedestrian also has a wallet, <laughs> right? Is your neighborhood a place to um, spend time or drive through via saving time? And that's what I want to kind of reiterate about our district is that um, our district extends from 20th Street in the south, 31st Street in the north, 6th Ave in the west, uh, Park Ave South in the east, then we go as far east as Brook College area, um, which is about Lex along 23rd Street. Um, but really it is working very closely with DOT and stakeholders on redefining what the heart of Flatiron is and it's best enjoyed walking, bicycling, or taking transit. Um, it's also very good economically, so uh, our board is supportive. We have no poison pill members, um, very sane, very supportive. Uh, they understand, they're savvy enough to understand that some changes up front might be difficult, like taking parking away, but it can be better utilized for other uses like outdoor dining, trash containerization, et cetera. Uh, the other thing that um, I wanted to mention was, um, I don't read the New York Post, but our operations team surely does, <laughs> right? <laughs> All the uh, uh, retired uh, NYPD members of our team. Um, but we really day in, day out, care about the district. You ever see Parks and Rec? 
We're all Leslie Nope. <laughs> Every one of us, we can't walk down the street through the neighborhood because we'll notice the sticker graffiti. We will notice a planter that's tipped over. We'll notice the illegal vending and try to address it. So it's really the day in, day out attention to detail that we have that only bids provide that you need resources for because volunteers are awesome, but volunteers get tired. Volunteers have day jobs. So dedicated resource staff is the way to actually get to that level of service that you need. Um, and by the New York Post part, I meant we, I think for a few years now in a row, have been named the cleanest neighborhood in New York City. And we take, a, we take that very seriously in, um, in Flatter and Nomad. That's very impressive. <laughs> and we're jealous. Um, yeah, so I will talk a little bit later about our expansion project, but that is something that has, you know, we've been working on for almost four years now. So it's been a, a big thing that we're hoping to come to the end of, of soon. Um, but I'll get to that later. Um, a project that we're very proud of is our, our public art series. So we call it the LAC Arts Connection. We're able to um, do around three to four installations each year. We try to um, use different parts of the neighborhood, work with different stakeholders, uh, do different calls for artists and different modes of art um, through that series. And something that we started last year that we're excited to bring into this year and probably for the years to come is really looking at how the neighborhood is changing during that year, what businesses are coming in, what themes are we seeing, and then using that to you know, uh, replicate into the, the public art piece, and then having that public art be sort of a way to call, call out these themes. So last year, we noticed that almost everyone walking around the street has a dog, and all these dog businesses are opening up, and all these pet businesses are there and opening up and thriving. And we realized, one, this is a great way to remind people to pick up after your dog, but uh, also to call out all these businesses to really support them. So it was a way to engage with the community, put something beautiful out on the street, but also have it fun and, and speak to the neighborhood. So we're looking forward to using that, you know, looking at the themes, looking at what's going on in our, in our district to you know, amplify in public art. That's awesome. Thank you all for sharing. Just thinking about how diverse all those projects are and how each of them isn't a single lane project, right? It's all these tie-ins and I think that's what bids are really good at doing is like bringing all the right people to the table so that you're not just doing an art installation, you're supporting the businesses and you're not just creating a plaza but you're creating a, a way for people to feel part of the community. Um, so we're talking about public art, we're talking about business services, we're talking about picking up after your dog, we're talking about advocating with city agencies, we're talking about the state of the trash cans in the public realm generally, right? Like all of these projects sort of underscore all the little nooks and crannies of our work. So thank you for sharing all of those. Um, as we in this neighborhood are thinking about whether or not the bid is the answer, um, I'm really curious to hear from all of you. I don't think any of you were around when your bids were formed, but we all inherit the lore when we're in our roles. So if each of you could speak a little bit to kind of what the neighborhood conditions were that made the bid the answer for your community. Um, and then after we kind of go through that, maybe we can get into some of you that have expanded more recently, whether those conditions are similar or not. Um, but just kind of starting at the beginning and maybe we'll start in the opposite direction and work our way backwards. Yeah, sure. <laughs> cool, um, thanks. Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, so our the partnership has been around for 40 years. So the partnership, Long Island City Partnership, functions more as a local development corporation. It's its own separate nonprofit, but it manages the business improvement district. So we're, it allows us to share resources, allows us to have a little more robust like marketing services and events and stuff because we can use those services that wouldn't be totally, we wouldn't be able to fit into our, our bid budget. Um, the bid has been around since 2005 and similarly went through um, a rezoning and it ha you know had a big increase in population. It actually grew, it's the fastest growing neighborhood in New York City. It grew faster than the, the New York City in jobs and population. Um, and so the bid was really a way to kind of pick up where, or was at the start, it, you know, the rezoning came in 2001 and the bid came in 2005. So we sort of dealing with that change in the neighborhood and as the neighborhood has grown, as have the need for services um, and to keep on growing with the neighborhood. We um, expanded in 2017, which allowed us to kind of further service the more commercial streets that were growing there. 
Um, and then now we're looking at, you know, the, the neighborhood just keeps growing. The, what weren't commercial streets before are now becoming commercial streets. A lot of retail is opening up. A lot of new development is coming in. Um, and so, so it goes um, as the, the need for, for mostly sanitation, I think, is the biggest service that it's the biggest part of our budget, the biggest service that we provide. We have people out there seven days a week right now. Um, and you know, the more that we've been there, the more people from outside the bed are saying, like, we need we need this on our street. So that's that's what kind of uh, grew our expansion. Um, so the Flatiron part, the Flatiron Twenty Third Street Partnership, the original name of our group was founded in two thousand six, uh, a few years after the Madison Square Park Conservancy was founded. Um, and then Danny Meyer and his team with Shake Shack uh, kind of re reformed and retrofitted what was a beautiful Victorian garden park that fell on its knees and then came back with, um, with the Conservancy Services. Um, we used to joke that we were the blob around Madison Square Park um, we, when we, before we expanded in 2022 and squared off our, uh, our service area. But really it was, the need was, was clear because we were between two bids already. We were between 34th Street Partnership to our north and we were between um, Union Square to our south. And so when we saw those neighborhoods being cleaner um, and better maintained and businesses were doing better, I think that was a wake up call for um, the commercial property owners in the district to form a bid, um, which admittedly, the, the, there's a rich history of, um, of advocacy and um, merchants organizing in the district because I have the original um, documentation in my office of the 23rd Street Association, which was ground floor retail from 1929. So there was a lot of act activism and, and advocacy in the district pr well prior to 2006, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, our services, we have, um, sanitation's our bedrock. It's our biggest service, still is today. Um, you know, we'll season, we, we, uh, we do contract that service out. Um, we have 40 people during the slow season, up to 75 during peak season. Uh, you know, taking care of the streets from 6 a.m. till 8 or 9 p.m., depending on the time of year. Um, we have homeless service outreach. We have um, public safety teams that are mostly ambassadors. Um, they're not armed or anything, but they are eyes and ears in the streets. We have a district-wide horticulture program, which is substantial now. Uh, we also have uh, marketing events communications, and we're also district advocates. So it's like we have six services um, that we offer, um, but we're, again, we're eyes and ears every day in the district, but really it's, uh, it's grown from, um, you know, a, a bid that has a budget of when we first found it, about $2 million, and then we expanded in 2022, and now we're about $7 million. So we're, we're a fairly substantially sized bid now, um, and yeah, our services are, are appreciated by, by those in the district for sure. We all started at the same time. Dumbo also started in 2006, uh, had also gone through rezoning. The neighborhood was just starting to be redeveloped. Uh, there were very few residents, there were residents, many residents, there were many industrial focused businesses and, and those spaces that we all love here and in Dumbo. And there was a real need for advocacy for street infrastructure. I think that's one of the main drivers of why the bid was founded. Uh, sewage, drainage, obviously Hurricane Sandy sh reiterated that need. Um, and, you know, Fast forward, after much, much effort from council member's office and the, and the bid, that we broke ground in 2019 on that major street reconstruction project, which is you know, fixing the electric. All, all of the utilities, the water main that has not been upgraded since 18-whatever when it was installed, um, and fixing the roadbed building line to building line, really significant project. Uh, that we've that was very much like an impetus for the bid formation, and then of course, as everyone else has said, sanitation services, um, and really, I don't. There wasn't a strong Dumbo brand in 2006, and I think that was another impetus for the bid formation was to sort of think about who is here and what do they want to say, and how can we all get together and say that together, uh, and I think that that's has very much been a core of our work since then. And the, you know, as we've all said, bids evolve, communities evolve, neighborhoods evolve. Um, we didn't have a big sanitation program and now we have a very big sanitation program. And we've added pedestrian management to that program uh, because the neighborhood is very busy. Uh, and that's what people, that's what the business is, that's what the residents, that's what everyone wanted. Um, so I think that the, yeah, so really, 
advocacy at the city level, and then sort of like, what is the Dumbo story, and can we help tell that story and sort of bring everyone around a story? Um, yeah. Is everyone's biggest programmatic expenditure sanitation? Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Same. Yeah. <laughs> Followed by horticulture. Yep. Huh. Yeah. And I know, Katie, you can speak to this better than I can, but I know that's a recurring theme when, when you and your team have been talking to neighbors that sanitation is a huge need. And as a resident, I see it with my eyeballs every day. Um, I'm also really struck by, you know, as somebody who cares quite a bit about this neighborhood and is an urban planner, I'm really struck by the fact that there wasn't a bid that happened here in this neighborhood when it experienced a rezoning in 2005. And I think you all talking about how your bids kind of went hand in hand with the rezoning, I think it's important to underscore that um, in a lot of ways our neighborhood I think is late to the party of a bid formation. And so I'm really excited that there's this conversation that has some momentum that's continuing. So um, really happy for that. Angel, you talked a little bit about your bid expansion, and I know you're right at the finish line, like you're right in that legislative stage. Can you tell us when you're expecting services to start and then kind of give us a sense of like what that timeline's been from the idea of how we should maybe be over in this neighborhood to we've got boots on the ground picking up trash? Yeah, well, I'm looking at Leslie over there. <laughs> been Come on, Leslie. Us. Yeah. <laughs> She's been helping us along the way. Um, we actually have one of our meetings tomorrow at, at City Planning Commission. Um, but yeah, so we are scratching at the door. We are hopeful or hoping to um, be able to service come July of this year. Um, if that doesn't happen, that's okay. We've been doing it for a long time. We can, <laughs> we can do it in January. Um, no, it's going to happen in July. Everyone in this room is going to manifest <laughs> yes, the services yes, start in July. July. Um, yeah, so we're hopeful for that, but you know, a, a lot of it is, is scheduling and stuff that is a little out of our hands. Um, but we, we started this kind of official process in 2021. Um, we also kind of have a, a confusing and unique um, expansion experience. So we are currently really looking at two expansions at the same time that are gonna fall under the same bid, but be sub-districts of a bid. Um, and the reason for this is we are also industrial service providers for the IBZ and, and Long Island City. And we work very closely with the industrial businesses and tenants in, in that industrial area. And um, I think it was 2016, a working group was formed in one portion of the IBZ where it was, there was still a lot of foot traffic. It's where LaGuardia Community College is. So they had a lot of students walking around. A lot of people just realized there's like outside of where the college is, there's just not care for the neighborhood. There's a lot of streetscape issues. There's really not a lot of city services that go over to that side of, of Sunnyside Yards. Um, and so a working group was formed that kind of put some money to, to pay for things like holiday lighting to make it a little more safer at night <clears throat> and um, also to pay for an ambassador to kind of be out there on the street doing 3 on ones talking to the businesses, uh, talking to city agencies about the different streetscape things that were going on and really advocating for, the, for that area. But that, that funding you know, is not going to be there every year because it really depended on the, the working group to, to put it in. Um, and so in 2021, after a couple of years of that working group, we proposed the idea, or maybe it was more like 2020, but 2020 is a blur, um, to propose the idea of, of a bid. And they were you know, supportive. We had those you know, conversations with the people that were you know, already funding the working group. And you know, most of them were supportive. And then we just kind of went around and talk to other stakeholders and that kind of formed the idea. Um, the other s- expansion that we're looking at, because we, we realize that we're gonna move forward with this expansion on, on this side of the yards, that a lot of the interior streets of where the current bid is, is really becoming more you know, main commercial corridors and there's a lot of retail activity, there's a lot of people living over there, there's a lot of things going on and it's really not maintained very well. So there's a lot of garbage on the streets, a lot of you know, things like that, that people were coming to us and saying, can you clean, can you do this, can you do that? And we realized that we were getting enough of that, that um, there was a need for services over there that in 2017 there wasn't. 
Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of where that process started. Um, and we now are in the legislative phase, so we are, are nearing the end. We went through the, I would say, the plant that outreach took about a, you know, a year and a half, and then the planning phase as well. Um, and you know, a lot of it was just making sure that we got to connect and talk to all the stakeholders that we wanted to, needed to. We did a lot of public meetings, a lot of community board visits, made sure that everyone was aware of it, and we kind of are, are nearing the end with a lot of support behind us. So it's you know, been a long, a long road, but an exciting one, so. Congrats on being right there. I love scratching at the door. That's yeah. so visceral <laughs> to me, and being like, let us do it, we're ready. Um, so it sounds like maybe about three years from steering committee formation to services. Yeah, I mean, I would say like the idea had started a couple years before, mm -hmm. but really when we started organizing ourselves and, and talking to SBS and getting the steering committee and you know the needs assessment and all of that was about three years ago, yeah. Got it. And then Kurt, you guys just are what, maybe two years into an expanded bid? Yeah, so we expanded uh, Jan 1, 2022. So we were January. Um, but um, we had some fits and starts with the formation. I came in 2016, and one of the main pillars was to help get the bid expansion done, right? Um, and the, we actually started really hitting the ground hard on that probably in 2019, so probably about three years from start to finish for the, um, for the entire uh, expansion. We added over 1,000 properties to our roles, so we more than doubled. Um, and we received, I'm not kidding, one ballot saying they didn't want the bid. And it was because the property owner thought they were already in the original bid and didn't want to, be, didn't want to pay for it. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it was, it was one of those things where I always say, what does a bid do? I always take someone to the edge of the bid and show them one side of the street than the other side that's out. That's the visual impact. That's the day-to-day -day impact. So people, property owners in the district uh, you know, we're very happy with our services, and those on just on the periphery were like, where the hell are our services, right? So that's why we expanded in large part was to rectangle off our service area, really close the gap between us and 34th Street Partnership uh, to, the, to the north, and similar to what you said about, about neighborhood brand, Nomad became this thing, right? And now it's like the hot thing in, quote, Midtown South. Um, so it's, uh, it's become this like hospitality hotspot with the Virgin Ho Hotel opening, the Ritz opening. Um, kudos to uh, the Ace for seeing that a decade before anybody else. But um, you know, that neighborhood's kind of like gone from um, really a wholesale district to now being this hot like F&B district which that does, that does bring in like what kind of neighborhood doesn't, should it be, right? So those conversations are part of it, but the, um, the expansion was quite smooth, and thank you SBS for helping us kayak some of that for sure, um, but we had a lot of support, steering committee was incredible, um, and actually what's kind of interesting now is we should have expanded south to close the gap between us and Union Square. We really should have taken, we should have, we should have, we should have tried to get 19th Street. Um, we should have maybe gone west of 6th, um, toward 7th Avenue. Should have gone maybe east of Park Avenue, south toward, toward, uh, toward Lex, because everybody who lives just on the edge wants it, and at least in Manhattan bids where we don't assess residential besides the $1 per year, it's the best deal, not in New York, but on the planet. <laughs> that you get these services. It's the only good deal in New York, for sure. So, but our, ours was, yeah, ours was a three-year process, pretty much, soup to nuts, and um, same thing, you know, we're, it was all about open communication, transparency, um, really just walking everyone through the process, and uh, we were in a great position of kind of being begged for it, so. That's super helpful. Going back to sanitation, since I think we've established that's the core of bid services, right? Um, okay, so everyone, provide, all of us provide sanitation services. It's the biggest piece of our budget. Show of hands, anyone have in-house sanitation staff? No, we're all contracted. Um, do you have, <laughs> except Katie, sorry. You're behind me, I don't even know you're here. We're not a bit. So. Okay. <laughs> um, and then what about, do you have dedicated staff to manage the sanitation vendors? 100%, yes. Yep. Great. 
Okay. Um, and then, Kurt, I think you got to this a little bit about just standing on the edge of the district and being able to see the impact, but can all of you talk a little bit about the impacts, particularly of the sanitation? And Carl, maybe start with you and move on. Sure. The, um, so we work with the Doe Fund. They're in the neighborhood seven days a week. We have two supervisors and then trainees. And we actually just hired a trainee uh, who really rose to the top and was just amazing. And we figured out the money to hire him. So now he's our operations manager. And he's taken on con like sort of managing the Doe Fund in-house for us. And, that's, and he works Thursday to Monday because Dumbo is so busy on the weekends that we need eyes on the street now seven days a week, which, was, which is new. We didn't have that before. Um, and we've also added pedestrian management, which I said, for our open street. Um, we don't have an edge in the same way. Our edges are Con Ed substation and the BQE and the river. Uh, so I think the impact is there's less of that line where you can tell as obviously, but the, but I mean, it's just, you know, night and day. You know, we have big bellies now, which we inherited from the uh, downtown alliance because we couldn't afford them on our own. And, you know, those have, those are great, but people still need to empty them. Um, so there's, we've really doubled down on sanitation in a way in the last two years in particular, uh, because of the open street, because of just Dumbo is busy. People, people want to be there. They want to live there. They want to open their businesses there. They're potentially one of their first or second stops in Brooklyn if they're visiting. Uh, so it's definitely something that we've put a lot of resources into. Yeah, you're reminding me too that we maybe haven't even sort of outlined the idea of what sanitation services are. Oh, sure. Right? Yeah, so we were talking about this a little bit. If, if you all kind of, in your responses, want to get into like what all of the, the pieces of sanitation provided services are, that would be really helpful. Sure. For us, it's very much um, sweeping the streets. Uh, so not everyone is good at putting their trash in cans. Uh, so sweeping the streets and emptying cans. And then we also do quite a bit of graffiti management, but that's not true of every neighborhood or may not make sense for every neighborhood. Um, and yeah, that's really, and you know, we do a lot of power washing. We manage a lot of public spaces in the neighborhood that are DOT spaces as opposed to park spaces. And so they are Belgian blocks or asphalt. And so they get power washed. Um, so these kinds of things. Um, yeah, so pretty similar. We it's it's we work with um, Street Plus, and we have around seven ambassadors that are out there seven days a week, um, and I manage them <laughs> uh, along with a team. But um, we yeah, they mostly do st as like street sweeping and the curbside and on the sidewalk and bagging the trash. We have our branded bid uh, trash bags on the corner that we're hoping <laughs> to not have on the corner so much longer. Um, but we, uh, they also do graffiti removals once a month, um, and uh, we are able to kind of keep up with what they do. Like, it also gives us a sense of how many people are out there and walking around, and because they give us a count of how many trash bags they go through on a, on a monthly and daily basis, so we're able to track that. It gives us a sense of how busy the neighborhood is. It also, they um, mark off like how many containers they, they cleaned off, how many things that they're doing each month. And it, you know, we see that it grows a lot when like, you know, we were watching it through COVID. There was really not that much going on. People weren't throwing trash in the bags anymore, so they were going through significantly less. And to be able to see that, change from day to day because we also don't have other, I know a lot of other bids and neighborhoods have like pedestrian sensors or data where they collect foot traffic and stuff like that, which is great. Um, but we, we don't have that. And so we, we use the kind of the trash data to see how many people are, are out there and it's, it's been helpful. Um, yeah, so our, our, uh, our sanitation team is also through Street Plus. Um, it's a for-profit company based in Red Hook. Um, they do work around the country. They're incredible. Um, and they, just like you guys, you, you all went through an RFP process to get, you know, the, get, a, get a good quote from them. So uh, competitive process, they, they, uh, they came through for us again. Um, yeah, we have a team of, again, about 40 to 75, depending on time of year in terms of daily street cleaners, um, sweepers that are out um, sweeping sidewalks, bagging trash, removing trash bags. Um, they also do a lot of public space uh, management work with us. They deploy, they put out the tables and chairs every day. They put up the shade umbrellas every day. They lock those up at night. Like they're out there doing very, very demanding jobs day in, day out, and they're incredible. 
Um, we also try to pay, you know, a livable wage to them. So we're not, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not a minimum wage job, but it's, we're trying to get above and into the point where we're paying a livable wage for all of them. Um, but yeah, they, they sweep sidewalks, bag trash, remove graffiti. Um, let's see, they, uh, what else do they do? They, they do um, clear snow and ice from certain district walkways, um, many of them on plazas that we manage. Um, yeah, they do all kinds of stuff for us. And in a typical year, now that we've expanded in two years of that, it's about um, 250 to 300,000 bags per year of debris from the streets. So similarly, we want to remove, um, remove what we call haystacking of bags, because it's gross, from district sidewalks, right? So we're trying to um, cart our own trash with our friends at Street Plus if our friends at Sanitation will allow us to go to their facilities. Um, we do a lot of, um, one of the big things that bids do and do a good job of is working creatively with agencies. Um, and for instance, someone asked me like, why does, DOT, um, why does DOT do so much in your neighborhood? It's because we say yes to things when DOT asks us. We, 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 don't, have, we don't come to, um, one thing that, uh, that I think is very important for bids is not to get caught up in the bullshit and not to get, not to get in these neighborhood fights, but just provide services and do the job you're actually contracted to do with the city agencies. That's like very important. I think in bedrock for us is sanitation. Um, you know, we're asked all, all the time to make it, you know, take a position on things and we just don't do that. So um, we're sort of nonpartisan in that way. Yeah, I think you're pointing to, to sort of bids abilities to innovate and be nimble and be responsive, which, you know, I'm thinking about projects that I know each of your bids have done that I think really push the envelope of, you know, like you're saying, you're, you're talking to city agencies and you're making them rethink the way that they are doing the work because we're asking them to move things forward and yeah. do something really creative and innovative. Yeah, help them out and then it can come back to you in spades, right? Right, exactly. Um, to dig a little deeper into that, I'm gonna ask kind of a, a closing question before we go to Q&A. Um, you know, for the, the north side bid formation efforts, it's early days, it's needs assessments, and so it's a lot of conversations with people out on the street to really understand what the challenges are, what services are needed, and that informs what will happen when the bid gets set up, right? But you all are working for bids that are decades into providing services, and so I'm hoping you can speak a little bit to like what that looks like as a transition over time and how decisions are made about how to allocate resources, when to expand services, when to pull back on things, and really just to kind of exemplify that those changes can be made and that, that nimbleness is there. Um, so Kurt, do you wanna go first? Um, we try not to get away from um, you know, making sure that the, the baseline service is exemplary. We don't have an empty tree pit in the district because I care about it and because our operations guy cares about it. Um, if we notice it, we're gonna get it filled. Um, I think that's how we operate it at, at a level that's, um, we think it's pretty high, but we wanna keep it there and then go from there. We don't want to have, we don't wanna spread resources thin in areas um, that work really well. But for instance, you know, when, um, when our events um, manager has a new idea, which she always does, we wanna say yes to that too, right? So um, it's one of those things where, um, you know, budgeting wisely, uh, being conservative fiscally in some ways, but then having, we have, we have resources that we, can, um, that we can tap into for certain things, have a little bit of fun, right? So uh, that's one thing about a larger bid is that you have resources to kind of play with a bit and try things out and uh, kind of iterate over time. Our um, uh, plazas, um, just to bore you with the 90 second version of that, is um, they, they, we're still in quote temporary materials uh, for our plazas and they were started in 2008, right? So they're temporary permanent plazas um, that if you stand at 23rd Street and 5th Avenue and Broadway in that, our, our major intersection, that used to be Fifth Avenue and Broadway Roadbed. Now it's public space and it has been forever. And you know it'd be it'd be sacrilege to take that back to for car space. But it's still temporary materials. We treat it like it's you know Times Square and it's been built out in capital, right? So um, you know kind of we're told you know there's no capital money for this, no capital money for that. But we try to roll with the punches a bit. Um, I hope that answered your question without too much rambling. 
Totally. Okay. I'll also just quickly point out, not to feed you an answer, but I think a lot of us do surveys of our stakeholders, you know, over the years, and I, I know Flatiron does a very robust annual survey. I looked at it a couple of weeks ago and was like, wow, they're getting into it. It really made me feel like y'all are taking in that data and then using it to make decisions about the coming fiscal year, and I, I think that is amazing. Yeah, I mean, we time it. Um, we just, we launch ours, we always try to launch it like the first week of January, just so we can say we're the new year. This is like the 2024 annual community survey. But it's asking questions about the previous year because those answers people give us do direct some resource um, allocations in our budgeting process. So it's not, we, we do say that in the, you know, in the, in the blurb uh, that it helps us allocate resources, it's not a lie, so yeah. Clara, do you want to talk a bit about how yeah, things I mean, have changed over the We do something very, we don't do quite as robust of a survey, um, but we, you know, we're outside every day walking the district seven days a week and just literally talking to everyone. Literally every small business in Dumbo has my personal cell phone, the, for better or for worse. Uh, and I think that we, we, we exist to absorb what people are telling us and then to figure out how we can f put all those things together and help everyone in the neighborhood, uplift everyone in the neighborhood. And so I think that we really think about Dumbo as an ecosystem. It's not just a commercial corridor, it is an unusual, I mean, that's true of Flatiron too. The partnership, the district is a neighborhood. It's people live there, people work there. There's a lot of different kinds of needs and interests and we're always listening to as many people as possible. I host focus groups every year to think about programming, cultural programming, that's my main piece there. Um, to really say like, what do people want to do this year? Like, what's what's changed? Like, who's who hasn't been presented yet? Like, who's still whose voice is missing from this mix? Uh, so really thinking about like just talking to as many people as possible. Of course, we consult with the board. The board is a good representation of the stakeholders in the neighborhood. Um, we also have a very wonderful board. Uh, the so that's, you know, that's like a big piece um, in terms of how resources are allocated. Um, but we're really listening to folks and saying like, okay, we need this. How can we make that happen? Board, do you agree? Yes, okay, let's go, let's figure it out. Um, and as you said, we can be very nimble. We are four people, we can try things. You know, we like to be like very Dumbo-esque that way. Like, let's just <laughs> fail forward like a tech company and see what happens, you know? Like, that makes sense for Dumbo, right? So we definitely are trying things like that all the time. Yeah, so kind of all of those things. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we also do a survey and that is always really helpful. Um, we have kind of grown it so it's not just one stakeholder that we're, we're listening to, but we try to get residents involved with that, the commercial property owners, but also the commercial tenants, even property managers of residential buildings. Um, so we, we do that and that's always helpful to just learn um, what is going on and I, I would say the, the biggest thing people want especially the businesses and the residents is they want those connections to be made and that's kind of a big thing that we have uh, filled in I would say is connecting the residents to our, our small businesses connecting the property managers of residential buildings to the businesses and making sure that there's we can make the connection and then walk away and that they're going to still promote the people promote to the people that are living there that, you know, stay in the neighborhood, spend your money in the neighborhood, and, you know, support local is sort of our big thing. So I would say that came, that did, that wasn't always something that we did. We grew, I would say COVID kind of brought that out where we were, you know, forced to really, or, you know, really wanted to uh, focus on supporting the businesses that had struggled so, so much during COVID and, you know, tell the residents that were there like what's going on and then we realized we should just keep doing this and and this should be kind of you know hallmark hallmark of what we do and people should know that we're we're here but also like they it really is about connecting um you know people there to to stay in the neighborhood and, and hang out and spend money and you know spend you know go to the the local bar and not go over to brooklyn <laughs> <laughs> or manhattan <laughs> just kidding <laughs> Hey, good evening. My name is Phil Smreck, and I'm with the uh, People's Firehouse. I'm on the board of the People's Firehouse. And I'm just curious if you incorporate or ask uh, the nonprofits in your areas to be involved and how you ask them to be involved and 
what their participation would be and how they sort of play into or benefit from these programs. So for example, on the north side, we have El Puente, further on in Greenpoint, we have St. Nick's, and then right here on the north side, we have the People's Firehouse. So tell me a little bit about that. Oh yeah, I mean, I don't do anything in Dumbo without a partner in the neighborhood. Are these microphones working? <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's very... They are? I'm so curious. Because I don't hear it because I don't have a monitor. <laughs> the, um, the, I mean, in Dumbo, we don't do anything without, without a neighborhood partner. I think that that's, that's just critical to the way that the neighborhood functions. So if we're launching a new art project, it's with the Brooklyn Arts Council or with Smack Mellon or with St. Anne's Warehouse. If we're, you know, we're working on the open street, I mean, everything has a nonprofit partner essentially in everything that we do, and that's... That helps us do our job better because we don't know everything. So it's really important to us to incorporate as many um, as many stakeholders as possible. And those are certainly the St. Nick's and the People's Firehouses of the world, for, for sure. Ditto. Uh, we don't, um, nonprofit property owners are also exempt from paying assessments. So uh, keep that in mind. But yeah, we, we uh, similarly, we do, we, we do um, work very closely with neighborhood nonprofits and, uh, and schools. We've, we partner very closely with the SVA and Baruch College all the time. We have an intern program with Baruch College we love. Um, Poster House is just outside the bid, but we bring them in. Um, Center for Book Arts was outside the bid. Now they're part of the bid. They even paid us $1,000 a year prior to um, being part of the bid when they were in the expansion area to be a friend of Flatiron. Um, but now we bring them in um, because they're officially part of the bid and don't charge them $1,000. Um, but yeah, we work very closely with nonprofits um, throughout Flatiron Nomad. Um, similarly, in terms of public art, always work with nonprofit partners. Um, yeah, it's very important that you are not an island to yourself. Yeah, I'll quickly echo both of those answers. Um, but we, we also, so because we have the partnership, we have a separate board, so we actually have two separate boards <laughs> that is fun for all of the board meetings that we have. Um, but there is a decent amount of nonprofit um, organizations that are on that board. We have a few museums, we have a few cultural organizations, and um, that really helps us sort of, you know, especially with our public art series, it helps us decide on what we're gonna do and, and you know, help them, you know, as she said, as, as partners. Um, but in the expansion as well, we have really worked with a lot of the schools our, our public art has worked with the schools. Um, LaGuardia Community College has been a big um, proponent in our in our bid expansion, and you know they're kind of a loud voice saying we're we have so many people here, so many students coming in and out every day, and there's not a garbage can in sight, and we need the bid here. So they've been great, and we're looking forward to keep continuing those partnerships. Hi, I'm Diana Selvin. I'm um, co-chair of the board of North Brooklyn Parks Alliance, so I'm very excited about this. I was on the board of North Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce and uh, business coach and psychotherapist. And um, my question, a little more for Kurt, because uh, some years back I had an office on 21st and Broadway, and my husband's photo studio is on 23rd between 5th and 6th. So we spent a lot of time in the neighborhood. And then through the pandemic, I wasn't in the city that much. And I was like, holy cannoli, Nomad like exploded with all the restaurants and hotels. And I was so curious, what role does the bid have in shaping what businesses come in? It's really remarkable. Um, very little. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think, um, you know, Flatiron has, has been a kind of a hospitality and F&B scene for a long time. Um, I think the drastic changes are Nomad, especially along Broadway. Um, and a few property owners there have, have um, done a really nice job in renovating spaces along, storefronts along Broadway and offering them for, um, for market rent um, and kind of curated more of an F&B scene there. But I think it was um, a long lead play with the hospitality development that was going on with the Ritz and... Um, and uh, uh, the Virgin, they were they were they they were ten year projects, in in uh, up in Nomad. And um, I will say that 
Um, you know, people are always talking about Midtown being dead and it's not what it was. We don't have that in, in, in Flatter Nomad, in large part because of the mixed use nature of the neighborhoods. We have 36,000 residents. Um, we don't have 125,000 people coming in day in, day out for their jobs anymore. Um, Tuesday through Thursday we do. Mon nobody likes Mondays and everyone loves a three-day weekend Friday. But um, Tuesday through Thursday the L trains and Sardine can again. I live in the neighborhood too, I live in Greenpoint and walked to the L today and I was like, oh, geez, it's Tuesday. Um, and um, so we, we've actually seen um, along the Nomad Broadway corridor, for instance, from 25th Street to 31st Street, 130% increase in pedestrian foot traffic since pre-pandemic. And a lot of that has to be from, um, from visitor traffic because we know that Monday through Friday, it's only about a 65% um, office occupancy in seats. Um, but yeah, I mean, before the pandemic, we had more fast casual to, to support nine to five business workers. Now we have more um, full service restaurants and higher in retail that's catering to the, um, the tourist crowd. But do you think that the bid attract, yeah, I mean, I know the hospitality yeah. thing was in play, but the bid made it more attractive to? The neighborhood is, is more attractive in many ways, I think, yeah. Um, we, we tip, we, we're in a very um, privileged position that we don't have to do too much um, retail recruitment at the partnership. Um, if anything, um, we see churn more than we like just because some, some concepts work, some don't. Um, but we have very little to play in the, in the mix, so to speak. Um, I would personally like to see you know, a little more everyday essentials in the neighborhood. I am very excited by the possibility of some um, affordable apartments in that part of Manhattan because there are zero, um, probably negative zero, I don't know. It's, um, you know, one bedrooms are $6,000 in the neighborhood. I don't know who affords that, but it's, but occupancy is 99%. So it's like uh, the neighborhood is, is, is um, needs more of a mix of affordability, it needs more of a mix of retail diversity that's not just F and B. But, um, you know, everyday essentials are there, but it's, it's a it's a slow it's a slow mix of uh, you know high end F and B kind of taking um, taking a lot of the spaces. I'll quickly jump in to say that at least on Grand Street, I think we thought about the work of like retail attraction. We've done a little bit of matchmaking when people reach out to us. We post you know available properties on the website. We've done art events to draw attention to some of those available spaces. But for me, when I think about the bids role in that kind of retail attraction. It's really like, make it nice here, right. <laughs> like a build it and they will come sort of vibe. Like if we make this a nice neighborhood where people want to spend time, we will get tenancy that makes sense for the community. Uh, and I think a lot of bids take that kind of approach because there's so many market factors that are way beyond the scale and scope of what a bid can do, um, but we do have some of those people like on our boards, right, who can make some of those decisions and do some of that influencing. So I think a little bit of that happens behind the scenes too. Yeah, I, know. One last yeah, thing I was gonna I say that. Say about Flatiron is, um, the neighborhood's very pricey, there's no doubt about it, but um, the ground floor retail mix is still about almost two thirds non-chain or non-national um, chain, or international. So the, um, what we're seeing is a lot of, um, a lot of entrepreneurs making that, you know, staking that neighborhood as their investment, um, as opposed to, well, it's all Starbucks, so. That's totally the same in Dumbo and something that we're very proud of, but I was gonna say that it really depends on who the property owners are. I think we don't have that many property owners in Dumbo, we know them all really well, and so when there is an opening, we get asked what people are saying they want to see in the neighborhood. Um, so we can't say bring this particular business, but we can say we really need a grocery store. Uh, and then we get a grocery store. Uh, so I think for like an essentials and things like that. And I think the other thing that we've, people know to reach out to us because we're the first stop for questions. And so what I've seen recently, which has been really interesting and, and amazing, is that there's a lot of Dumbo residents that are opening brick and mortars. And so we're the first person they call to say like, where do you think I should look? Like, where would this fit? Like, what street, what block, what, what property owner? Um, and that has actually been really fun. So while we, we don't make decisions, we have certainly been able to have those conversations to say like, we're, we're hearing from a lot of people that we need X, Y, Z, or, you know, I have this really amazing small business. Where can we find a room for them? Um, so that has been great. 
Katie, how many questions do we have time for? Are we? Okay, great. Hi, good evening. My name is Nam. I'm, I own the climbing gym up the street. Uh, can you speak to the governance of how uh, bids are run? Uh, it sounds like there's a board, how's the board formed, et cetera. Um, can you speak to the mandate and the charter of a bid? Is it specifically business oriented or is it, has it grown wider than that? And then lastly, can you speak to sort of the pie chart of the funding sources of a bid and what the assessments for businesses are? <laughs> do you, Kurt, do you want to do I, I can start. One? I can start, sure. <laughs> or um, sure thing. So governance, yes, we are. We have a board of directors. Um, the majority of the board are, pro are commercial property owners. That's just our makeup of our, of our board. Um, and so we have members of the board who are commercial property owners members of the board who own um, office-based businesses within the district, uh, ground floor businesses within, a, within the district, um, residential um, board members, and then public members who, are, uh, who represent SBS or the, your elected officials, et cetera. So that's the governance of the board. Uh, we have multiple board meetings per year. Uh, the board approves the budget. And then we have a public annual meeting every year as well. So um, the slate of officers for the board is presented at an annual meeting. Um, the budget is presented, and public the members of the of those who come to the annual meeting are the are the public members who actually approve those items. Um, other questions were, what would my assessment be? <laughs> right. I'll, do you want me sure. to jump in and talk about like assessment stuff? We sure. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Sorry. Okay. I get to talk about bits, and I have a microphone in my hand, and I'm really excited about it. <laughs> um, for the, how the assessment is sort of distributed around the stakeholders, um, I would say that there are no two district plans that are alike of the 76 bids, except that's a lie because Grand Street and North Flatbush weirdly have the same district plan. We were <laughs> formed very, very early and clearly the same consultant wrote those plans. Uh, but otherwise, I don't know of any two bids that have the same distribution of, of the, the shares of the pie, so to speak. Um, and so, as this bid comes into existence, or as any bid comes into existence, you look at the whole makeup of the neighborhood and decide what kind of the most fair way to, to spread that burden is based on who's using those resources after the fact. Um, and so the simplest answer is like, it's a community conversation that the steering committee is gonna be engaged in here for the next year or so. How does it work in the Sure, so we are, uh, Kurt kind of mentioned the residential piece. There's sort of trends of when residential buildings get assessed or not, it ebbs and flows over time. Um, it was very in vogue to charge a residential assessment fee in 1984, evidently. Um, and so Grand Street is one of the few bids from, you know, I would say before the last 10 years that has a residential assessment fee and they pay roughly 40% of what our commercial properties pay. Um, our assessment is all based on linear frontage. so. For us, I mean, just to like give a dollars and cents number, and again, this is no two bids are the same, but on Grand Street, the average property or the mean property uh, pays about $1,300 a year in an assessment. And I think it's worth its weight in gold to have your street swept twice a day, <laughs> somebody taking care of your neighborhood, somebody to call when things go wrong. Did that get to all of your bits and pieces? That's about an assessment pie chart, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Pie chart. Yeah, so we are about, um, I'll, I'll be totally transparent. We're under 20 cents per commercial square foot. We are a commercial, we're a square footage assessment. So we have 36 million square feet of commercial space in Flatiron Nomad, which we always say is more than the city of Miami. Um, so we have 36 million square feet of commercial property and we have about a six, six just over $6 million total assessment. Our total budget is about seven. So the vast majority of our funding comes from assessment. We have about a one to one and a half million dollars of earned revenue a year on um, plaza site fees, kiosks that pay rent to have a, a kiosk on our public plazas, uh, film and photo shoots, and then some sponsorship program as well. But it's vast. You'll, you'll see, I think, pretty safe to say that most of our funding across the board, regardless of size of bid and type of assessment, would be um, funding would be from your assessment. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, I think, different grant opportunities available in different neighborhoods. And, you know, so for Grand Street, we were able to fundraise 50 cents on every assessment dollar last year. That's extraordinary. That is not the norm. But, but it does underscore that a bid gives 
a neighborhood a vehicle to collect some of those outside dollars and invest them really, really locally. And so you get return on investment in those assessment dollars. I think we have time for one or two more questions. So then we've got a yeah. mic over here. Hi. Um, I'm Christina and resident Williamsburg for 27 years, Jane and Grippo. We are on Grand Street um, in Bedford Avenue. Um, by the look of the map that you showed, uh, the boundary is quite limited to just, it stops at Metropolitan Avenue. My question is why wouldn't you consider pushing it farther south to Grand Street or even to Broadway because um, it's, you know, the Williamsburg is changing so dramatically, even, you know, with Domino Park and all the, the businesses going on on this moving south towards, at the very minimum, Broadway, um, and at the very least, Grand Street. I mean, because, you know, we, we're working so, you know, dig diligently to communicate with our community board member, Gutierrez and just to, you know, there's so much trash, there's so much, you know, there's uh, businesses and restaurants and sheds that nothing gets cleaned up. It's, it's problematic. So, I mean, really, would you consider including both sides of the street, north and south? I mean, you're talking street. to the wrong person because when, oh. when I started thinking about this, I was like, okay, all of community board one. <laughs> <laughs> She's well, laughing saying because that's I very mean, difficult. My, I'm just saying because before, how did you come up with that? And, and so so, be, and wait. then and then I thought, well, uh, how about the footprint of the rezoning, or you know, how about uh, you know the new town creek down to the bridge, um, and in just having conversations with other bids, with the steering committee, with SBS, that said, you know, you, if you're going to go through this process. Uh, then you should do it in a way that will make it advance it and actually make it work. And the larger the geographical boundary is, the more difficult it is to pass. Because but what I, my question also is if just listening to him. I mean, he said that he would have wished that he expanded it further. So be, before we have to wait to be expanded into, I mean, yeah. wouldn't it be great if if we communicated with people on Grand Street at the very minimum to see what um, what their feelings are about it. Because, I mean, this is, a, if it takes so long, like years and years for it to get established, and another years and years and years for it to expand, before you've made the commitment to eliminate, like, beyond Metropolitan Avenue South, you should really consider a little bit, like, what, or else, like, do you recommend that we start our own bid, which is, you know, who knows? We don't know anything about this. I think maybe one difference uh, in the example Kurt was talking about is that that was an expansion. And so there was a proof of concept um, at on those blocks uh, where you had that demand of, of, yes, we want that service too. And that's one reason why I'm connecting it to the work that we do as the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance because we have been providing those services or those kinds of services in our capacity as a parks organization. And that um, it can show the sort of before and after, but the scale is quite small uh, when you're talking about uh, you know, having limited resources, right? And so the idea is to expand resources to do more services. Um, if you can't get enough folks to uh, buy in and agree, then the entire process is moot. Uh, because if you can't get it passed in the outreach phase, if you don't get the majority of votes uh, uh, to to get it to the legislative phase, it's it's going to fail. But, and but Grand Street is just too, like from Metropolitan, you're only looking at North First and Metropolitan. You want to answer? No, I was just going to say, we, we actually are including Grand Street. Um, in, I'm sorry, I'm going to No, yeah, we, we are including Grand Street. I, I think that that graphic had a, had a slight mistake because um, that's what we, I'm Theo Perch Advisors, I'm working with North Brooklyn Parks Alliance, um, walking them through the technical um, 
phases of bid formation. And, and yeah, I think that that's what we did agree on, was to look at Grand Street to North 15. Yes, so, yes, yes. But in thinking about, like, uh, we've also been asked about going further down in, into South Side, which is a huge, which is a huge um, mm -hmm. uh, demand uh, and desire. Um, and so, sorry, I, I guess I, I wasn't sure about which exactly, what geography no. you were asking no, about. The, the map that was up said Metropolitan, and mm -hmm. yes, at our steering committee meeting, because I live on Grain Street. <laughs> yeah, 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 we are. We are considering Grain Street. I, 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 I
uh, that detailed uh, 20 some odd recommendations for how we can fund parks and open spaces in New York City. Um, things like stormwater management, stormwater fees, uh, things like uh, sub uh, 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 ticket subsidy uh, on, on, at sports stadiums for like an extra dollar, couldn't that go to support uh, parks and open spaces? One of them was an improvement district. And so as uh, the city is also thinking about how to create these sustainable funding models, um, uh, it's something that I was talking about with uh, other nonprofits in the area. So sorry to call you out, Paul. I had a lot of conversations with the chamber. Uh, you know, uh, I had conversations with Evergreen. Like, are you guys going to be doing an improvement district? Um, you know, because obviously we are very much at the forefront in the public space management aspect of bid services, which. Uh, the, these guys uh, talked about a lot, which is one reason I wanted to hear what they had to say about how they were working. And because in seeing how bids operated on the ground and organizing our own services, uh, I'm thinking, you know, what we do is so similar to what a bid does, right? In terms of, again, public space management. Um, and so, uh, but how can we expand that and ser better serve this community? And again, how can we sustain it over time? Uh, so that's kind of how I got the conversation started. Um, also, again, looking beyond and outside the neighborhood, uh, had many conversations over the last several years with the Gowanus Canal Conservancy, uh, which is another organization that's very environmentally focused uh, down in the Gowanus going through a rezoning, and so they were also looking at uh, this like parks improvement district or public space focus improvement district um, that is uh, basically using the business improvement district model to support what, of course, we're calling the, the public realm at large. So that's how the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance got involved in the conversation and has been spearheading the, the formation um, and the logistics of how it would be executed um, is something that I, I've been watching the Long Island City Partnership, uh, given that they are a longstanding community nonprofit uh, that you know created a separate nonprofit uh, and shares a board um, and services and resources. So that is one possible model. Another one could be like the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, which is actually a conglomerate of a variety of different bids in a particular geographic area working together. So the exact logistics, I'm 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 not sure how it would work, but that's how how we got involved. Thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate that. And that's a lot of really great thinking. I think. And maybe we've got one more. Hi, real quick. Uh, my name is Sean Goff. I own uh, Depener and Depener Wines on the corner of North Third and Moyth, and we've been there about the wine store. The, the food store has been there 14 years. Anyway, what I wanted to say was just reading this has been the answer. I could see, here's an anecdote that might help answer that for me, or just publicly a statement. Uh, we had trash issues for a long time, and we. Um, we put trash cans at ourselves, but that was a bit of a nightmare and you know, just overflowing and expensive and people putting in ridiculous shit in the trash cans and stuff like that. So um, I had emailed Lincoln um, at wrestler's office to get a trash can and a stop sign, which, which showed up, which was great. But of course, the trash can increased the trash and made it even worse. So they moved the trash can. Anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say is I could see how the kind of extra layer would actually make a huge difference. So, I mean, there's not really a question here. It's just kind of a statement, so. <laughs> anyway, thanks. I mean, yeah, trash is magnetic, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think uh, it's, it's, it, it's time. Um, and so I know you have a lot of questions. Uh, you're welcome to uh, have a drink out in the bar um, area. I think we're allowed to be here for a little while longer, and then um, we'll, we'll call it a night. I really do appreciate everyone for coming. This is the beginning of, as you heard, a, a pretty long process, and I'm sure that this is only the first of many conversations we're going to have. Um, am I forgetting any points, Lynn? You're good to go. Oh, thanks, <laughs> thanks. So thanks everyone thanks, for coming, appreciate it.